Hello and welcome to another edition of Book Buzz. I'm Giovanna Fiorino Yanache, and I am here virtually with my colleagues Bob Herster and Kenji Kaneshiro. Bob is our new librarian at the West Harrison branch and Kenji is a library assistant at the Harrison Library. Today we're coming to you from both locations to talk about some books that we think you will enjoy reading. Let's hear from Bob first. Bob? Okay, uh, hi. Um, uh, I am gonna talk about one of my all time favorite books. I've read it a uh, couple times cover to cover and countless times in snippets. It's called Fifth Business. It's by a Canadian author named Robertson Davies. It's a letter from a retired teacher who taught in a private boys school in Canada. And the reason he wrote the letter is because when he retired, one of the, they had a little party for him and one of the teachers wrote sort of a, um, you know, a little tribute to him. And um, this fellow felt it was trite. It didn't do him justice. And he was really angry about it. So he wrote a letter to the headmaster to set the record straight. And the letter is 238 pages long. Um, so <laughs> he closes the letter with the words, and that headmaster is all I have to tell you. He talks about an event that happened when he was a very small boy. And he was out with a friend of his named Percy Boyd Staunton, who he refers to as a friend and enemy. They were very young boys and um, Percy threw a snowball at him with a rock inside of it. He threw it really hard. And, um, oh, the narrator's name is Dunstan Ramsey. So Dunstan, he sees the snowball coming at him, he ducks. And the snowball, thrown very hard with a rock inside of it, hits a pregnant woman named Mary Dempster. And it hits her so hard that it causes her to give premature birth to her son, Paul Dempster. Now, that event ties these four lives together for the rest of their lives. Dunstan is consumed by guilt because he ducked. That snowball was meant for him, but because he ducked, it hit Mary Dempster. And, um, and Percy, Percy acts like it never happened. He doesn't remember it. And so this book follows their lives into adulthood. The, the book has uh, several themes, um, love, guilt, duty, myth, magic, ambition, revenge, and rebirth. And also the name of the book comes from opera. In opera, fifth business, and this is how the author defines it. These roles, which belong neither to those of hero nor heroine, confidant nor villain, which were, none, were nonetheless essential to bring about the recognition or the denouement. Hence the player who acted these parts was often referred to as fifth business. So that's Dunstan's role in this book. He's telling the story. And so two of the biggest themes in the book are guilt and rebirth. Um, as I said, guilt over the incident plagues Dunstan for the rest of his life. And a friend of mine who I recommended this book wrote a blog about it. And this is what he wrote about um, uh, the aspect of guilt in the book. He said, fifth business showcases how the shadows of guilt eclipse us, consume us, and how it may take a lifetime to emerge out of it or submerge into it. I, I've gotten different things out of the book now than what I got it when I was when I read it when I was young. And um, actually, I read it when I first moved to New York, and I first met my future wife, and I I first met a group of friends, and we all read it together, which was so much fun to be reading this book, and discovering New York, and getting to know new friends, and then my wife and I got married. And we went to um, France for a honeymoon. And I read the second book of the trilogy, which is called The Manticore, which I also loved. I read that in the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. And wow, what a treat that was. Um, so The Fifth Business is by far my favorite. The Manticore also very, very good. And I enjoyed the third one, World of Wonders, but I definitely The Fifth Business was my favorite. And now my colleague Kenji 
is going to talk about the book he's recommending, The Queen's Gambit by Walter Tevis. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about The Queen's Gambit. So you may have heard of the recent Netflix series that's come out. It's a seven episode mini series and it's based on the book by Walter Tevis. It follows Beth Harmon, uh, who's a nine-year-old girl, I believe, at the start of the novel, and her rise to fame as a child prodigy in chess, while she also negotiates hurdles of addiction and being a woman in the 60s. Chess is what really drew me to the story because I'm someone who travels for board game uh, competitions, uh, which that's just what I do. And what ended up keeping me interested in the story was the strength of Beth's character. She's assertive in her genius and witty in her rejection of institutions that would try to diminish her, uh, be it the orphanage she grows up in or the male dominated field of competitive chess. If you're looking for a short drama with just seven episodes with a strong lead, I really recommend the show. I enjoyed the show so much that I had to read the novel and was pleased to find that much of its better qualities were directly from the text. The cleverness of Beth's dialogue clearly found its origins in Tevis's succinct writing. His dialogue is much louder than its brevity, as it must be with a character as introverted as Beth. I love the way the chapters would fan out into these rich paragraphs of scenery or games being played out, only to funnel down into quick exchanges punctuated by one word responses or actions from Beth. For example, a teacher who runs the local chess club needles Beth with questions during a game, as met with a bunch of brief yes and no's from her as she handily defeats him on the board. She has this constant and unapologetic nature that remains a highlight of the story, further driven by relatively few words and what Tevis aptly leaves unsaid. One of the greater achievements of the story is how Tevis draws out and engages you with the interiority of chess. And what do I mean by that? So in chess, the ability to plan out future moves is critical, whether you're planning out the next few moves or even the next 12 moves as the book sometimes does. And the show depicts this by having uh, this animated board that Beth looks at on the ceiling. And it's with these larger than life pieces. It's very ghostly and kind of flickering. It's this really awing visual. And without the advantage of a screen, the novel accomplishes this by having this dance between the technical language of chess with the emotional context of Beth's games. Uh, I'm not really very well versed in competitive chess, so I couldn't quite follow the board notations that Tevis uses frequently but the narrative tension of the game and how you know, her move might hinge on the next move or how an unexpected uh, response comes from her opponent. Uh, there's this narrative tension that Tevis communicates um, such that you're invested in the game without fully understanding all the technical moves. And it really, Tevis finds this way to communicate the game with, without making Beth's internal voice feel downplayed for the reader. Uh, it really makes you feel like you're hearing her voice. When I first learned that the show was based on a novel published in 1983, I was also curious how much of the show was newly invented for it, since it did have sub-themes of sexuality and race that were present, and I was, you know, I'm kind of curious if that would still be in the book. Uh, and while the LGBTQ characters are largely absent from the novel besides the subtlest of suggestions, if even uh, issues of racial inequality were actually sharper in the novel, I found. Beth's narrative affords longer meditations on the privileges afforded to her for being white compared to her childhood friend Jolene, who's black quite frequently. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention Beth's adopted mother, Mrs. Wheatley. She's introduced as this character who is this very stereotypical 60s housewife who's trapped in her gender role. But as the novel goes on, there's this turn where she really becomes a partner in Beth's pursuit of chess in a very unexpected way. It was one of those parental relationships in a novel that I found to be, it felt authentic in a way that's not always accomplished in novels. And I really appreciated what Tevis did there. While the plot is nearly identical between the book and the show, uh, there are enough differences that I feel like pursuing both is worthwhile. Uh, the character of Beth was so compelling that I really had no trouble going through the story twice. So definitely, you know, read and watch both if you can, but if it's just one, that's fine too. It's a really great story. I highly recommend it. And now I'll turn things over to Giovanna. Thank you, Kenji. Well, the book I'm discussing or recommending is called Passing, and it's by an American author, Nella Larson, who I had never heard of uh, prior to a few Months ago, one of my book club members actually brought it to my attention. 
So I was intrigued to know a little bit more about it. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit about the author since her, her background is so interesting. She was born Nellie Walker in 1891 in South Chicago and her parents were Danish immigrants. Her father is thought to be have been an Afro-Caribbean immigrant from the Danish West Indies and her mother was a Danish immigrant. So before becoming a writer, she studied nursing. She worked in Tuskegee, Alabama and came back to New York at around 1916 and worked as a nurse at the Lincoln Hospital. And she also worked with the Bureau of Public Health in New York. And this was during, by that time, this was in the Bronx during the 1918 flu pandemic, which has been on everyone's mind these days. And, and she married a, a physicist in 1919. And a year after her marriage, she started writing her short stories. And they eventually moved to New York City, to, to Harlem. And that's where she started volunteering as a librarian. And I, this is, for me, is the most fascinating part is that she worked nights and weekends as a volunteer with Ernestine Rose. And she was working to prepare the first exhibit of Negro art at the New York Public Library. So Rose encouraged her to, to study librarianship. So Nella Larson became the first black woman to graduate from the New York Public Library School, which was run by Columbia University at the time. And this opened the way for integration of library staff. So she originally started working at the Seward Park branch on the Lower East Side and eventually switched over to the Harlem branch, which is where so many immigrants from around the country were, were congregating. So she made friends, this is Nella Larson, had made friends with important figures from the Harlem Renaissance, and she eventually gave up her work as a librarian to write full time. She published an autobiographical novel called Quicksand, which was widely uh, acclaimed, but was not financially lucrative. And she wrote her best known work, which is Passing, the one that I'm recommending, in, which she wrote in 1929. And it deals which, as you can imagine, the reality of racial passing. So she focuses on two childhood friends, Claire and Irene, and both of whom are light skinned, so light skinned that they can pass as white. And they've reconnected after a number of years apart and have led very different lives. And we have Claire who's chosen to pass as white and Irene who's embraced her racial heritage and she's an important member of her community. So two direct opposites. The novel is under a hundred pages and explores how people pass on many levels. So you have different forms of passing. Some are perfectly acceptable and others are not and can lead to disaster. And though the novel is short, it is very gripping. Uh, I really found myself wanting to finish the book. And it reminded me of a recent bestseller by Britt Bennett, who wrote The Vanishing Hat, which has a very similar framework and different storylines, but very similar in that they're both dealing with this aspect of passing as white. And in Bennett's book, she explores other forms of passing, which are very um, intriguing and much more complicated maybe in the terms of the character development. So some have read Larson's book as an, a story of repression, and others will argue that it's actually a way to explore ideas of race, class, and gender. So the, the novel opens up the idea of new and self-generated identities. So we we'll hope you'll read it and tell us what you think. And on another note, I, I when I was looking into Nella Larson's history, I found that it's actually, the book has been turned into a movie that was just recently released at or shown at the Sundance Film Festival. And it will be available through Netflix later on in the year. And I did have a question for Bob uh, in terms of, we know that the, the Queen's Gambit has been turned into a series. Any, any films or mini series based on the fifth business? That's a great question. Um, I 
really, really would love to see it made into a film. And I thought the perfect directors um, and producers for it would have been Merchant Ivory. Uh, I think one of them has passed away, but they made some beautiful, beautiful films like Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. I, and I think they made, they might have, yeah, I think they made a film called Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. It was based on two books, one Mr. Bridge and one Mrs. Bridge. And the other director, I think, who would be a, do a fantastic job, and I don't remember his name, the person who directed the first Harry Potter book movie, which I thought was absolutely fabulous. But no, it hasn't been made into a movie, but I did, in my research preparing for this talk, I did see that there was an attempt and it got mired in um, some legal issues. So not yet. And uh, it would be very interesting. I'm sure it would be very challenging because you know it's, it's, it's a very complex story and there's a good deal of sort of interior monologue and so forth, but a lot of colorful characters. So yeah, short answer is no. And boy, I sure hope a really great director <laughs> does do it. If you read any of these books, let us know what you think, whether yes. you hated them <laughs> or loved them or eh, they were okay, because it's always interesting to get feedback from you, from our readers. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Till next time. Be well. Bye.